you could start by telling your name and when and where you were born and your education and how you came to be involved. <clears throat> Fine. I was born in Mound City, Missouri. My name is Jack Abbey. It hasn't changed with history or marriage or any other thing, as some people's do. That's a small town, about 1,400 people now. It was 1,200 when I was there. So it's grown, wow, that's a lot. What, 20% or so? And a small farming community. My dad's a merchant and had a grocery store. I worked for him there. Friends of mine went to the University of Nebraska from there, and that's where I went to school. Followed them in whatever year that was. I graduated from high school in 1941. Went immediately to the University of Nebraska. The war caught up with us. <laughs> and I was summoned, I got greetings and went off for physical to find that I had tuberculosis and they didn't want me in the army. So I went to the local doctor and he says, oh, we'll have you fixed up in no time and then the army will take you. Well, I wasn't terribly interested in <laughs> that process, but in the meantime, well, uh, almost immediately upon that finding, a friend of mine was delivering a car to his family from Mound City to California. I thought, well, it's time I did something for this war. Maybe I could go build uh, Liberty ships or something in California. So I jumped in the car with him, helped with the driving, went toward California. Uh, and on the way through Albuquerque, I, we stopped at a brother, my brother's house for overnight. And my cousin was there who had applied for a unknown job in the hills up above Santa Fe in New Mexico, and <clears throat> she had a spare application. I just filled it out and put it in. And by the time I reached California, they were trying to get a hold of me by phone and want me to come back immediately and go to work. I says, no, I can't do that, but I'll be back after a bit, <laughs> and did. And that's what happened and how I got into Los Alamos. I think what excited them was that I had, a, I had worked for the physics department at the University of Nebraska. They didn't, didn't know that that job was only in the stockroom and issuing supplies and equipment to, to undergraduate students for their laboratory work. But that's beside the point. <laughs> it said physics. And the people who were recruiting or looking for help up there certainly well, that's all they knew. <laughs> they didn't know about physics or what it entailed. Worked there for three years, mostly for Emilio Segre. I, uh, fit, well, he was of that team, Amaldi, D'Agostino, Fermi, and Segre. He always made a big point of that. He was the youngest member of that Italian team that discovered uh, the slow neutron and its uses in this kind of work. They got a patent on that, by the way, which was fairly interesting in as much as they, their boss, <laughs> an Italian, sued the U.S. and a government after the war and won the suit. They each got, I think it was $150,000, whatever <laughs> they did to, to buy that the rights to use that in atomic bombs, which they'd already done, but that's, but after a fact, was kind of nice. Uh, Fermi had won the Nobel Prize before he got here, and he that's how he got here. He was headed for Denmark to receive it and took that, chance, that opportunity to escape the uh, clutches of the Nazis who were becoming very strong in Italy, and their anti-Semitism was strong along with them. So he took his family to Denmark to receive the Nobel Prize and kept going. 
<laughs> never turn back, I think is the word. Segre came along later and uh, he still didn't have his papers when I worked for him in Los Alamos. He wasn't a citizen yet. And he later got a Nobel Prize, he and Chamberlain, another member of our group there in Los Alamos for their work on the anti-proton. But the, these are <laughs> interesting things to physicists only, I think. So I just toss them out. Well, what do we do there? We were mostly filling out uh, some details of the atomic chart and uh, working on isotopes and examining them to see if they might be potential fissionable materials, that kind of thing. So we made, largely was chemistry, making small samples of each of these elements as they came along and counting neutrons that came off of them after they were struck with slow neutrons and to see if any of them produced two at <laughs> the same, as well as the fission products, see if they actually fission. Well, <clears throat> developed technical equipment to do that, fission chambers and fission counters and this kind of thing. Well, that was part of our work, so what we did for the test of the nuclear weapon when it came along and was the same sort of thing. We had fission detectors and neutron detectors and stuff, which we flew from balloons and had buried at various distances from the blast. And we could, our task was to determine the yield of the weapon from these various uh, technical procedures and parameters, namely how many fissions were produced. The uh, photograph, I wasn't a photographer, that wasn't my job, except I did carry a camera ever since high school, almost daily, and of course I couldn't anywhere around Los Alamos, but Segrave decided he wanted a photo history of what the group was doing so he got me appointed official photographer for the group and I used most of the time his camera but I took mine so I could carry it all the time. He was using his own <laughs> anyway but uh, when we went to the Trinity site for these ideas he negotiated with the director and with the uh, security services got my official appointment as a photographer and one of the few people who had a camera at Trinity. I finagled a, a roll of, code, uh, not Kodachrome, it was, uh, ooh, the German photo outfit, a hundred foot length of color film, which they offloaded into a cartridge uh, or several cartridges and carried it to Trinity. Film was hard to come by during the war, certainly color film. So uh, that worked fine. And by the time I got around to the, uh, the actual test itself, I only had four exposures left on the film I had taken down there. So <laughs> I had to hoard it very carefully. and. Uh, that, that was a serious error because that was the most interesting part. But the night of the detonation, I moved out away from the uh, area in which we were sitting out to where the lights of the community area weren't in front of me. Used, uh, turned a chair backwards that I'd carried out there and sat in it using that as a tripod, aimed the camera at the detonation point, which was roughly 6,000 yards away. I don't know how many miles that was. <laughs> About three, I think. At any rate, <clears throat> I 
opened the shutter all the way was it was not clear we were going to get any kind of a yield or detonation out of this experimental device. That's what it was. It wasn't a bomb or any such. It was a chunk of material surrounded by high explosives. Well, anyhow, I opened the shutter wide, the full way, full stop, and <clears throat> put the uh, shutter on bulb and held it open. It was black out, just ahead of the detonation. And when, when it went off, it became clear that it was a good yield. I released the shutter, it closed, I cranked it, the exposure down to where it was reasonable at about a thousandth of a second and fired the other three shots in rapid succession. The middle one, by luck, turned out to be just about the right exposure. The other two were usable, but not uh, as clear or in focus, all this good stuff. The picture was good enough that they wanted that the word got out that I had it, and before any of the other film, I developed the film myself. And in those days, that process was rather lengthy. I don't know, your photographers might know that, the nine-step color procedure and whatever. It was very complicated and time-consuming, but Anyhow, I borrowed a darkroom out of the laboratory and developed them myself. And they were just hanging there like any other drawing when it became clear it was a good, the last three pictures were okay and the middle one was a pretty good exposure. And somehow the theoretical division got wind of that and they confiscated the photo for a time. And they uh, actually did one of the first yield measurements by measuring the width of the fireball and uh, an estimated time of when that was made, and they could back calculate to something resembling a good estimate of the yield. It's turned out to be in agreement with the other estimates they had. I think they had to take an average of all the <laughs> measurements they had because they were pretty crude in those days. It wasn't long after that till uh, General Groves, who wasn't anywhere around, said he wanted that picture. <laughs> well, he got it. <laughs> and there, uh, so it was published fairly widely once the uh, secrecy was off and they could at least announce it, that they had then bombed uh, Japan and it was a, became public knowledge that such a weapon existed. So then they started publishing that picture as what happened at Trinity and uh, under the auspices of the U.S. Army photo. So my credits didn't stop or start until uh, later on. I was interviewed by a couple of newspapers and they finally started giving me credit that's where that is and that's what I did and this is only the most important event <laughs> in my life. There were other things, yes, I carried water, <laughs> as it were, dug ditches, and moved sand around our bunkers and this kind of thing, but that isn't terribly interesting. You did those things to get ready for the Trinity device? Yeah, oh yeah. We, uh, actually, there's a lot of the, the photo coverage I had of this is all in the uh, Historical Museum archives. There's, ooh, I don't know, and also some bikini shots that I took over there as an official photographer. And working for Berlin Brixner, is, is he on your interview list? Or is, He's on our list. I wasn't able to reach him. He's not well. But uh, he, uh, there were a number of pictures I took also, uh, 35 millimeter color shots that are in the archives at, at the laboratory. 
but the museum has all those that I had uh, in my you know, my possession for one reason or another. So did you, going back to Emile Sicre, um, what kind of work did you do with him? What was his responsibility? Oh, I didn't, I really supported all the other uh, the, the really physicists with the PhDs and all that good stuff, or the actually only two. No, I don't guess hardly anybody but Segre had a PhD at that term, you know, a professor's title at that time. And uh, I was uh, essentially an accounting technician. I did the work of taking the samples, putting them in a machine, and uh, observing them. We were looking for things like one event per month, so our gadgetry had to sit there and be carefully cared for over a month period. So we had 20 or 30 different counting instruments loaded with samples that just counted over a long period of time. So we had other things that were counted for short periods of time, shorter lived isotopes, but most of them of interest <laughs> disintegrated very slowly. So where uh, did you live? Were you a single man at the time? Yes. Uh -huh. And so what were the accommodations? We lived in a dormitory. Uh, hmm. I was also a uh, <clears throat> volunteer, I was volunteered for as a scoutmaster of the group up there and they um, actually promoted it and founded a group. We had to, couldn't reveal the names of our board or anything to the scout office and it was hard to negotiate terms with them to be called a scout troop. However, there was one at the old ranch school and we just kind of followed in their footsteps and they, the Boy Scout offices looked the other way and says, okay, go ahead <laughs> and, and we'll accept this. You just give us a number and say, you've got three board members or something like this. And <clears throat> we did that. But the reason I bring it up is that our dormitory caught fire one time during the war and when I got there, all the Boy Scouts were sitting out in front on my stuff. They had gotten out of the dormitory, but every <laughs> other people uh, didn't fare so well. The Boy Scouts to the rescue. Yeah, well, they, they always came over after school, sat around the dorm until I got there. Later on in the evening, it was a, more like a, a boys club for them. They, they had no other place to be. No official meeting house and that kind of thing, so it was that was handy. How many boys did you have? Mm, a dozen or so, thirteen. Okay. We had every every boy that was of school age because we even invented things called Cub Scouts, and we didn't invent Cub Scouts, but we invented the buds, which were <laughs> pre Cub Scout age. So we had from uh, 12 years or uh, whatever, six years, seven, eight years old, whatever the boy wanted to be in, he got in. So did you have uniforms? Oh yeah, the Boy Scouts had uniforms. Nobody ever had or really had one. <laughs> A few did, not very many. Was Emil Segre's son in that troop? No, his son was not up there. I don't know quite why. I, I just don't know. Yeah. I read his son's account of his father's. Mm -hmm. um, At least he wasn't at the beginning. I don't know where they maybe it came a little later. But all the technical personnel that I knew, virtually all of them, split almost 
as soon as they could. As soon as Trinity was over, they were making plans to get out and did. They needed to get back to their colleges very quickly. I stayed six more months to go to Bikini. And when I registered at the University of California on the way back from Bikini and then uh, returned briefly to Los Alamos to, to pick up my stuff and <laughs> go back to Berkeley. And that's, what degree did you pursue? I mean, you, you well, I pursued chemistry for, uh, for a time. Gave up on that. My interest changed to psychology. I got the degree in psychology because that was almost instant. There was uh, credits I had, and so. And, but then I continued to do physics from then on, health physics more, more specifically. It was kind of a combination of the two. So you went back to Los Alamos after. Right. Not not intentionally, that was just the you know, job. I passed exams for psychological social order and stuff in the state of California, and that didn't pan out. I gave real veterans too much preference that I would have better scores on the test, but then the four or five or a dozen points or whatever they got for being a veteran was put me down on the list far enough that it just the 120 people they needed for a job or whatever they were doing, and I didn't quite make it. So your participation in the Manhattan Project did not count as service to the country as a veteran? Not and unless you were a veteran. There were plenty of veterans there. <laughs> but if you were in the military, you would have gotten if you were at SED. Oh yeah, they were. That was their assignment. They went there as a uh, under orders, <laughs> and they lived in uh, military barracks, not not in where where I was talking about, not in uh, dormitories. Was there a lot of exchange between you know, let's say, your group of civilian employees and the military SED and? Yeah, you didn't hardly ever know. They did. You didn't know who was who, which was in and what's not. I think Segre to this day thinks I was in the SED, as a matter of fact. <laughs> he, he certainly knew better because he signed a lot of papers to get me transferred to his group early on. But uh, I don't know why, but the time he got around to writing his memoirs, <laughs> He'd written them, most of them, quite a lot earlier, actually, but in closing, he, uh, he got that confused and s stayed with it, <laughs> which was okay by me. I didn't care. As a matter of fact, there's some records to the effect I keep getting mail from the military that's offering insurance and this kind of thing. So I don't know. Actually, when we went to Bikini, we were assigned rank in the uh, military, or in the Navy. We went as commanders or above, <laughs> which was an interesting rank. Uh, it, it had to be done that way because uh, civilians in, uh, couldn't travel at that time on naval vessels. It was it was still close enough to the war that it hadn't relaxed that restriction. I don't know that whether that was an all-time rule of the Navy or not. I know it isn't anymore, but it was then. How hard did you and your colleagues work during the Manhattan Project? I mean, how hard six what? Six day schedule. And what was your schedule like? How? Uh, the schedule was very loose, but people worked many hours a day. They just, they were impressed, I think, by the leadership of the importance of what they were doing, and they did. They just, there wasn't any such thing as an eight hour day. Most of us uh, who had, like the counting equipment, had to be started early in the morning, and uh, even though it ran 24 hours a day, it had to be checked and serviced periodically, and even come over late at night and check it. And, and 
didn't punch any time clocks, but I think the government got their dollars worth out of us for the hours. Was there a, um, a sense of motivation because you were trying to race against Hitler and then you know, trying to make sure these things were ready to help out in the Pacific War? Was it there was some uh, some pressure, of course, uh, to get done by. There wasn't any deadlines or any such like this, except with a man like General Grove somewhere in the background. Always, <laughs> uh, it was like the big eye in the sky on your. Hey, you aren't doing enough. Or, I don't know what. It was that feeling that you could do more and you should do more. <laughs> you mentioned General Groves. Did you ever hear him speak? Or... Oh, yeah. So tell, Often. Me, tell me how he came across. Uh, upon various occasions, he came across like a uh, strong leader, leader, ambitious, and, uh, in a word, a bumptious ass upon occasion. But uh, that's personal opinion, <laughs> and I'm sure there are others. I get the sense from talking to people that he was often sort of the butt of some jokes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Often. Can you remember any? Uh... No, I don't remember any specific jokes. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah. There was some comic strip character that was a uh, oh I I know it was one of those generals that uh, in in uh, Al Cap's cartoons of Lil Abner, uh, who, <laughs> but he was that nickname kind of got applied to General Groves as. I don't even remember who the general was who was famous for his route at such and such and the retreat from such and such. What about Oppenheimer? What was the feeling about what kind of person and leader he was? He, I don't know. He was... Hmm. More, it just seemed like he was effete, is the word, more of a poet or an artist than a uh, scientist, yet he was very technically astute. He was very good at what he did, I, that's all I say. And I think he, need, he needed some kind of a buffer like him between uh, the military and, uh, and the scientific community. He could absorb all that, all those directives as punches, and then soften them when he offered a directive to his staff and employees. And it, he, he did a good job. That's all there was to it. Well, how did he um, treat the leaders like Sigre in terms of uh, giving them authority to run their groups and? Uh, I, he really understood that that's what he needed to do. He says, this is what they had, what is known, well, I don't know, there were group meetings, group leader meetings, periodically. They would kick around the ideas and they say, we should do this, and then assign various parts of it to, the, people would volunteer for them because their group was doing that kind of thing. and. I, as I understood it, it was very much up to the group leader how he did what he did and how he got there. And, and it, that worked <laughs> and with that group of people. I don't know that it would always work with all sorts of groups, but with certainly university professors and technical people that had their own laboratories and this kind of thing, it certainly did well. Were there uh, prima donnas among the group of these high, highly talented and intense scientists? Absolutely. <laughs> mm. 
we had one or two in our own group, actually, so it's, uh, uh, it's just, that's, I don't know, it's like any group. <laughs> there, some are going to be puffed up with their own importance, and some are going to be uh, not so puffed up. That's about it. There's just a whole scale of individuals and, that are entered into this. Scientists aren't any different than other people in terms of their emotional approach to things, except they are a little more, well, they probably aren't even any more directed than, say, an artist who is devoted to his art and is very, that's it, and it looks kind of narrow from the outside. But most of the technical people I knew were broad in the sense that they were musicians of some sort, or they uh, read poetry, or, or like Oppenheimer read the classics, like uh, the Hindu classics and this kind of thing. So it's uh, hmm. people with college education seem to get broadened in the process, no matter how narrow their interests may have been to start with. A fascinating group. Yes, it was. Did you know Ernest Lawrence, or? Well, I worked for him at Berkeley after the war, but I, in, but I, during the war, I didn't know him. I knew of him. I get the sense that he was a very optimistic person, very lots of energy and enthusiasm. Uh, that's true. Yeah, he was. Say, make it sound as I say Lawrence was. <laughs> uh, Let's see, I don't, well, I had a student job and I was essentially a janitor in, in the chemistry laboratory where, and, uh, or the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory as it was known as in Berkeley. And uh, I only had passing comment or uh, contact with Lawrence, so I, can't talk much about him at all. He was okay as an individual. Um, looking back on your own experience at the in the Manhattan Project, uh, was it uh, sort of a galvanizing experience for you as a person, as an individual? How did it change the rest of your life if it did? Uh, well, quite a bit. It, it made serious changes. The uh, one change that I, I guess is as impressive as any is that here I was, uh, a young puck going to school, meeting these people who were simply authors of the textbooks that I was using and Nobel Prize winners and this kind of thing, and that I would never equal that experience ever again. And I think the impression it got, well, why mess around with the chemistry? I'm not going to equal that ever, that experience, or equal their accomplishments. So uh, it was easy to switch for to in directions in which I had more interest, or at least I thought I did back at Berkeley. And uh, switching back to a technical career not long after that when I found it difficult to find anything to do as a psychologist that uh, I found that very easy and then resumed study uh, of chemistry and whatnot through various sources some the University of New Mexico and and with uh, other coursework in various places in specifically in health physics and health chemistry. And that's where my career rested, even after leaving Los Alamos. I worked on cleanup activities where um, the company I worked for, Eberline Incorporated, had the contract to go around and survey formerly utilized sites of the Man Manhattan district in the and there's some 31 sites over the United States that we went to 
on occasion surveyed them carefully with soil samples, air samples, and this kind of thing. And I was in the chemistry side of it more there than anywhere else, radiochemistry, and helping to determine that, <clears throat> what kind of cleanup was necessary in these areas. I'm also interested in your, you know, stepping up to be the Boy Scout leader. Um, and can you sort of comment how you're part of a new community and there is no existing institutions that everyone had to pitch in and try to make the community work? Uh, yeah, that was a part of it. I I volunteered myself for the job. I left it unclear that that's the route that really happened. When we've, the Los Alamos was stab established on the grounds of an old boys' school. That boys' school was patterned after the Boy Scouts of America. Mr. Connell, its director, uh, insisted that all the boys that come there, mostly problem children from the East, <laughs> wear Boy Scout uniforms all around, shorts, long socks, the real uniform, just like they had in those days, year round. You'd see them, the old pictures, if you go to the museum, you'll see some of them, of them skiing with shorts, uh, uh, short pants, and they did a lot of hiking. And one of the first people I met up there was a man named Benzis Gonzalez. He was with the ranch school during its heyday and its formative years, actually. And he was the director of, uh, well, not director, he was the camp cook, let's put it that way. <laughs> the camp cook, quartermaster, he did everything for them. And he, uh, his, he had three sons, and he lamented that there wasn't any uh, Boy Scout movement there. And so I said, well, maybe we ought to get one going. So we lived in the big house, which was the resident, the school's resident building before they got the dormitories built. And it had a library for the boys' use, and all of them were <clears throat> Boy Scout books and bird books and this kind of thing. So. And I had been a Boy Scout, and one of the last things was uh, that my Scoutmaster, when handing me the Eagle Badge, says, well, this is not the end of your Boy Scout career. It is the beginning. That if anybody ever calls on you to do any Boy Scout work, you're supposed to do it. <laughs> this was essentially it. And I unfortunately remembered that. <laughs> so I had to go ahead and do that. and did what I needed to do to reestablish the old ranch school's Boy Scout troop, Troop 22, and it's still that. They had to do some finagling after the war to get that assigned to that troop, but the number is still with them, I think. And, well, we, in order, we couldn't seem to leave out anybody, regardless of the age. As we had Boy Scouts in our group, one of Benz's sons was 20 years old, <laughs> and he, uh, I think, and uh, by the way, some of those might be of interest to interview if you're interested. Um, Severo Gonzalez lives in Espanola. Ramon lives in Colorado, but visits Espanola quite often. And they could give you a good idea of what the ranch school looked like before the laboratory got there, and then both of them worked in the, uh, for the laboratory after it was established. So if they would be interesting to interview. So anyhow, we had for all the ages, any boy in school really got into our group when, how, one way or another. Not all of them wanted to, but anybody that did was 
welcome. <laughs> and we hiked and we camped and this kind of thing. Well, there's one interesting point in our camping trips. We took a four-day uh, pack trip just uh, after the Trinity event got over and I'd returned to Los Alamos and so, okay, now there was time. I could resume the Boy Scout work. So we organized a four-day pack trip with uh, <clears throat> Ben Cesar, <laughs> camp cook and all the boys and we had uh, four pack animals and so on. So we took off across the Valle Grande or in that region and stayed out four days and we came back over the mountains and into the general area of the uh, S site area. Are you familiar with how that, okay, that we were coming in over the trails, the Camazon Trail that ended down in that area. And lo and behold, <laughs> the end of the war occurred just as we topped that hill and came down through the woods and just the Akowski decided to celebrate by setting off all the scrap TNT he had out there at that site. And groom, groom, groom. And pack animals don't care for that kind of thing. So our pack animals sent all this way, scattering equipment all the way through the woods, and we finally caught up with them and quieted down and we could get the horses back together and most of our equipment and come on back to town. And the boys asked me what happened. They said, well, I don't know, but I'm, I suspect the war ended <laughs> while we were out. <laughs> and that was what, what, what it was. Hmm. That connects the Boy Scouts to the atomic bomb. <laughs> oh, very good. That's a great story. Yeah, okay. That was really good. I'll use that one. Terry, do you think of any other sort of funny stories? <laughs> uh, oh, no. <laughs> not, no well, not really. I mean, there may be others that occur to me, but I, right now I can't think of one. Yeah. What, um, what interaction was there? You now live in Espanola. What interaction was there from Los Alamos to the uh, surrounding communities, of the Hispanic communities and the Pueblos? Well, it was, uh, during the war, it was uh, very cordial, really. Uh, my boss, Gray, uh, was just learning English, and he spoke a lot of Italian, but he could talk to the Spanish people uh, who spoke mostly uh, Spanish, and they talked back and forth, and with just a little effort, they could understand each other pretty well, and so he... He was in charge of <laughs> some of the things that we did. Uh, Segre would just get fed up with how work was going. Ah, oh, heck, let's go fishing. And the whole group got up and got their fishing equipment and take a car of some sort and go off into, we went to Hamas Springs is what I remember. I've got several pictures of that where Segre standing on a rock, fly fishing and Chamberlain and all the other guys in the group doing one thing and another. But uh, this was how easy it was, <laughs> and it doesn't say how difficult things were, but if things weren't going well, there, there were ways of doing something about it. Either work harder to get it straightened out or take a little time off and think it through or something like this. That's great. I like that story, too. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Um... I guess there were a number of, I mean, did you go, you said the relationships were very cordial. How about with uh, San Aldefonso? Did you go to feast days? Was that oh, like yeah. Very good. One of, uh, uh, Maria the Potter had, uh, had, her son worked at Los Alamos in a physics group and we got along very well. He was really quite a good physicist, among other things. But uh, the 
<clears throat> we were invited to the Pueblos for feast days, this kind of thing, and, and everybody went. That uh, I mean, that had uh, could at uh, the time it occurred. Transportation was difficult, <laughs> so if you couldn't get there with a friend, or uh, they didn't provide buses or any such, or to, uh, and I didn't know a car, and very few people did. I, so. Did you ever go to Edith Warner's uh, tea house? Uh, I was there, but not at the time all the other people were. I knew where she was, and I knew what she was up to, and all this good thing. Well, I don't know. I think we, we've gotten great stories from you. Okay, yeah, good. This has been very, very helpful. If there was anything in there that is not on the tape, <laughs> those always feel free to use that tape, too. Oh, good. Yeah, no, definitely. That's great. Tom, do you have anything? Uh, other sites and other scientists. Uh, well, what I know of, and I certainly learned after the fact, not not during the war. We all we knew is that there were uh, uranium sources in mostly that that was some of it captured from the Germans in Holland, spirited out. Some of it shipped in directly from Africa. Some from Czechoslovakia. And those had to go someplace. Well, they came into New Jersey and were offloaded there on boxcars and shipped out to Middlesex in New Jersey. These I learned later. This is one of the sites we cleaned up, was the Middlesex site, where the ore was essentially high-graded. They uh, ran it through, it was roasted, kind of to make it easy to break up. And then uh, the parts of it that were most active was put in one pile, and the parts that were not so active were put in another pile. The interesting thing was that the citizens of Middlesex saw that as a nice source of driveway coating material, and they hauled it away and built their driveways out of the lesser pile of stuff, which was just sitting there. The rest of it went into barrels and was shipped off to uh, processing sites, such as Oak Ridge and uh, Hanford, well, sorry, Hanford's later. <laughs> and uh, the Oak Ridge fractions went to Hanford to build their reactors. And then the product from Hanford came back for, to Oak Ridge for separation. Uh, there were many sites, uh, most of them right around the New York area, New Jersey area. The others built up after the, uh, after the Manhattan District was out of it and the Atomic Energy Commission took over. And, but there were 31 sites that, for instance, the material that uh, the depleted uranium, as they call it, after it was separated, that's just the U-238, was not of much use for anything except uh, bullets. So they shipped it to Fernal. I, was that Idaho or Iowa? I don't know where Fernal. Wow. Uh -huh. Fernal, where it was developed as to, it was made in shells for anti-tank use and other, it it was much heavier than lead, so it had a greater penetrating power. It's, it's that simple, it's a physics, it's a weight matter. The guns could throw more weight and do more damage. Oh, the other interesting thing is pyrorific, and if it penetrates the tank, now you've got fire flying around inside. So uh, it, it's a fairly impressive weapon. Uh, uh, let's see what else. Well, that doesn't describe 31 of the sites, but... Uh, hmm. Did you have a knowledge 
when you're at uh, in in Los Alamos of what else was going on? Was there was there talk of you know maybe what the weapon was, or, or were you pretty compartmentalized? Did you care what what, what the other groups were doing? Uh, there were <laughs> uh, there were lots of jokes about that. Uh, I mean the the. Uh, Security tried to say, well, you can't use the word uranium. <laughs> this kind of thing. So some of the guys would print uranium up on a placard and carry it around <laughs> just, just to defy security. And we always played games with security of various sorts. We found a hole in the fence one time wide enough to accommodate a six by six truck. So we uh deliberately went out through that hole and back in through the guard station a half a dozen times in a matter of a couple of hours just to, uh, and now we had, they had a record there of this vehicle, its license plate and all this good thing coming into the laboratory and six times never going out. <laughs> These kinds of things. One time down in Pajarito Canyon, we, um, found a guard asleep, but it was where we had our counting site. That's out away, to, away from all electrical interference and other things that might disturb it, and it was all a battery-operated site. But they had two cabins. One of them, these were all four service cabins we used down there. One of them, the security, the guards, they weren't security then, it was GIs and military guards watched the site. We came down there one day, and the, the guard was propped up against the outside of the thing, sound asleep. His rifle was sitting there beside him, and <clears throat> we waited there for a while, and he didn't come over and inspect our badges or any such, so we had work to do. We went on in, did the job, got all done, came out, and he was still sound asleep. So I said, I wonder, maybe he's not all right. I'd better go up and check. Maybe he's sick or something. Well, he was, he was really just passed out, uh, probably from overindulgence in alcohol. But at any rate, I extracted a couple of shells from his gun, set the gun back down. See, now they were restricted. They had to account for every piece of ammunition they drew. We pocketed the shells and drove off. Uh, I don't ever know what happened to that poor guy, but <laughs> I hope he learned something from it. Other another time, the guards shot a bear down there, highly illegally, but it happened to be a mother bear, and the cub was still wandering around at that same site. And they decided that he would make a great mascot for their baseball and basketball team, because it was a so uh, they had it treed, it wouldn't come down from a tree, so we've, we agreed if they could get it, we'd haul it back to the lab for them. So they, they did, they lassoed it and got it out of the tree and then tied it in the back of our carryall. And so <laughs> we had to sit hunched forward because the bear could, he was loosely tied back there and he could put one paw on the seat and swipe at us up in the front with it. But we got him up to Los Alamos and they did keep him for a little while, but the game department got wind of it and made them turn him loose. Did you know, I guess getting back to the Vietnam War, did you know that the knowledge, because everything was pretty compartmentalized and some people have told us they had a pretty good idea of what was being built, even though they didn't know the whole picture. And some people have said, I didn't care. Yeah, how, how, did, how did you approach that? Did you, did you know? Well, uh, I, I knew, but I, I don't know when I knew. Uh, and that's one of the things that our presidents generally use. <laughs> when did they know? <laughs> uh, that makes a difference somehow in how you tell the story. But uh, I, I really am not sure. I had a pretty good idea early on, and I don't know whether it is somebody told me about it or whether I just deduced it from what was going on. 
It wasn't, uh, that wasn't the part of the secret. The real secret was, could it be done? And there, there was, that was when the cat was out of the bag is when it was obvious it could be done because he did it and it went off. That was when the Russians took an interest in the Germans who had said, well, it can't be done, and so on. Both Hitler and uh, Stalin blew the <laughs> chance. They had the information there when they questioned about it. As a matter of fact, it all started in Germany. Was there some sort of an indoctrination meeting or something? When you first got up there, and they, when did, what did they tell you about what you were doing? They had to tell you something. Well, I don't really, uh, I, somehow I missed all that if it happened. When I first, they processed my application, they wanted me to come there, and I, got there pretty early and I was there way ahead of any security clearance. So they didn't they didn't want to have somebody on the payroll that wasn't doing anything, so I got the job of driving the taxi between Lamy Railroad Station and Los Alamos. So the people I met were Niles Bohr, Enrico Fermi, but you see they didn't have those names. It was Nicholas Baker. <laughs> and so on. They had a code name of some kind, and uh, I knew who they were. <laughs> and I knew why they were there by the time I got there, and this was before I ever was cleared to be at Los Alamos. I mean, you, you don't meet those people <laughs> and not know that there's something involving atomic <laughs> or the nucleus of the atom is involved, and that's <clears throat> you also know right away if you've had high school physics that it's a lot of energy in there someplace and uh, somebody's going to try to figure out a way to get it out. So I, th that really couldn't have been a secret. <laughs> it, it wasn't. So. Go back to the Trinity test when you're setting up your camera on the back of the chair. Did you take uh, cover yourself? Did you have a no, all I had was uh, welder's goggles. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, one of the lenses was cracked, and so I, I saw <laughs> a line for a few minutes after the blast. Was there any discussion before that about the radiation? And were you assured that you were far enough away? At that time, nobody really had any sense of what you know, radiation damage did to the body. Did they? Uh, that's uh, more or less true. They had a pretty good idea. Louis Hampelman was the guy in hell, uh, the head of what later became known as health physics. He was in charge of all that kind of thing. And we all wore film badges and uh, dosimeters and stuff that <clears throat> nobody was really quite aware of what the dosage might be from the blast itself. But they were certainly aware that the ground around it was going to be contaminated. As a matter of fact, after the blast, a couple of weeks after, one of our jobs was to go down and mine the, the uh, crater. Because <coughs> the idea was that there probably was enough neutrons there to produce some very interesting isotopes. So we... Uh, mined all that nice surface material, that glassy stuff that was formed as much as we could, and we mined a truckload of barrels of that. I suspect it was a couple of tons, actually, of material. And we went down with shovels and put it in. We were all wearing film badges, which got blacker than the ace of spades, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, we did it, and they hauled it out, and they stored it in a bunker down there. And, the Army later just bulldozed it under, I think. But they did indeed uh, find a couple of isotopes that hadn't been known before out of that, the chemists did. They, they call that stuff trinitrite, right? 
The Trinitite's what they called it because that was the Trinity site and it formed this glassy material on top. But that's what happened to most of it. I know there's a, there's a shed there that sort of covers the ground where they left some. Right. That's, that, that was the reason for getting it all out of there. Uh, that was the reason we had. Uh, we didn't take near the total area of what it was. We just got enough for a ton or two. They didn't have any. If there were only, say, uh, a few <clears throat> grams per ton, you, it, you needed to get a, a lot of tons in order to get enough for a measurable sample. You remember Mrs. Curie uh, in her tons of stuff to discover radium. It was a, the same kind of thing. You just had to just keep concentrating it until you had enough to measure. <laughs>